Okay, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannes Bilamsson, uh, Associate Professor of Computer Science at Reykjavik University. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Angela Capra, who is uh, defending his uh, PhD dissertation today. Um, just uh, say a few words, so I really want to leave the time for him to speak about his own work. Uh, but uh, first of all, I want to mention the Antelo uh, comes from Italy. He did his bachelor's at Salerno University in 2006, and then he did his master's uh, in 2009, also Salerno University. But uh, his project, in fact, was uh, done with uh, us here at Reykjavik University, his supervision, his master's project. And this was through the Erasmus uh, exchange program. And so we met back then. And then after his master's uh, graduation in Italy, he decided to come back Reykjavik University to pursue the PhD degree, which he started in 2010, and this is the culmination of that work that we're seeing here today. And uh, it's, of course, we're always very proud of our PhD students, and uh, Angela is, is the third PhD student of uh, CADIA, which is the Center for Analysis and Design of Intelligent Agents, or Artificial Intelligence Research Center. The third one coming from here. And, is also my first uh, PhD student, so he is the first one graduating from the socially expressive computing group uh, that I lead at CADIA. Uh, I also want to welcome the committee members uh, that are here and also online. Uh, we have Dirk Island from Twente University and we have Tim Bigmuth from Northeastern University. Uh, we're able to come with uh, come to be with us here today. I'm very pleased to see them here. Uh, Anna Esposito uh, is in Italy, uh, second Naples University in Italy, uh, was not able to join us uh, in person, but she is here on Skype and she is the thesis examiner uh, for this uh, for, for the proceedings are going to be uh, 45 minutes of uh, presentation by Angelo. Uh, following that, we'll have uh, open questions for all of you here for uh, 15 minutes or so. And uh, then we will have a closed session after that, just with the committee and Angelo. That will probably last for an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. So, a reception for Angelo is taking place at 4.30. 4.30 on the third floor, this, this building here, the Mars building. So, above us on the third floor will be a reception at 4.30. I invite you to come back at that point. So I think that's uh, all I'm going to say for now, and uh, give the floor over to Andrew. Okay. So thanks, Andres, for the introduction. Welcome to this defense. It's a beautiful day, and uh, let's get started. So this is uh, uh, the structure of this presentation. We'll go through a quick introduction and some background information. And we'll move to a theoretical framework describing this thesis, including three user evaluation studies. Then from the theory, we'll move to the practical work, uh, and I'll show you a computational solution for the autonomous generation of agents in verbal behavior in the first meeting encounters with the users. Finally, we'll go uh, through conclusions and some insights for the future work. So, uh, before we start, I want you to consider this video and imagine that you are entering the doors of this very university, and there is a person here waiting for you and he he is actually uh, expecting uh, for you to come and to welcome you and maybe to assist you during your stay at university so based on your first impression of this person would you like to spend time with this guy later <laughs> and of course the only thing you can observe from his reaction is his body language how it reacts to you in this very first reading so now, let's say you are in an interactive 3D environment and you are reading for the first time this agent. So how about this agent? Would you like to spend time with this guy later? And that's the core of our research in this thesis. So the agent that you have been watching in this video is defined as an embodied conversational agent. And this is actually, what is, it, what, what is actually an embodied conversational agent? So first, it's an intelligent user interface or intelligent software, which can be actually embodied 
in a virtual character or uh, which can be embodied in a robotic form. And the most important thing of this definition is that they have conversational skills. So they are able to engage the user in a multimodal real-time conversation, which means that they can uh, use two modalities to communicate their verbal behavior, what they say, but also what, uh, uh, what they can actually show with their body or their facial expressions, what is called nonverbal behavior. A particular, actually, a particular uh, category of uh, embodied conversational agents has an additional skill, uh, which is um, actually, and they, are, and they are designed for interacting over a long period of time with the, the users. Those are named relational agents, and these agents, so they are able to establish and maintain a social relationship with their users. Why this is important for us? is that in a wide range of applications, uh, it has been found that being able to establish a relationship with the users, it actually improved the task outcome. For example, we can see at the bottom of the picture, agents designed to be a companion for elderly people and spend a lot of time with them in their houses. Or, for example, we can see in psychotherapy applications or in, uh, uh, as a coaching agent that they are at the hand of the users at any, uh, at any time and for a long period of time giving advice on uh, coaching exercises. And finally, for educational applications. So, for all of these agents, our main question is what would happen if people reject this interaction with them? So, we think and we demonstrate with this thesis that uh, the utility of, of these agents is lost if people reject them at the very first moment. So that's why first impressions are important for us. And I guess you know this guy, uh, he, um, uh, very useful, but maybe can be sometimes boring. And what we actually think, and we uh, draw from the human social uh, psychology literature, is that people, based on these first impressions with uh, other people, are actually predicting how the potential relation, relationship with them could be later. And what is exactly that people are predicting, and what are, well, how and uh, what information they are uptaking in this very first uh, interaction. So, first of all, first impressions can be shaped uh, by looking at someone's uh, virtual uh, appearance, like the makeup style, or, uh, for example, the clothing style. Uh, first impressions can be also formed by stereotypes, like the nationality of someone else, by uh, judging what people say, but central to our work by observing someone's nonverbal behavior. And in particular, by observing nonverbal behavior, it is possible to take information like the skill level of someone else or the sexual orientation, and in particular, with a subset of uh, nonverbal uh, cues that they are called immediacy cues, that they are widely also used for relational agents to establish their relationship and uh, reach, achieve their goals. So, for this particular subset of smile and gaze behavior or proximity, that means the distance between uh, the two persons, uh, there are two important characteristics that can be uh, uptake by people, personality and interpersonal attitude. So I will go into the details of, the, of these two characteristics just by observing someone's nonverbal behavior. For personality, uh, we actually based our thesis on a model called Big Five Personality Trait Model, which categorized uh, uh, people according to five big traits. This is also widely used in the ECA community. And uh, uh, according to, the, to these traits, the top one that you see, extraversion, it's one of the easiest to pick up by observing someone's nonverbal behavior. And it is, it is actually a desired trait to understand at the very first time of the interaction to see how that interaction could be later with that person and how the relationship could be. So we focused on this trait, the extraversion, for interpersonal attitudes. So we are actually considering them as a temporary and stable compared to someone's personality that is, uh, is supposed to uh, last uh, as a lifelong characteristic of a person. But this one, it, it might change depending on the context of the interaction and on the um, people I'm interacting to. And we based our thesis on a model uh, by Argyle. It's called the status and affiliation model. 
and uh, it, it defines two main dimensions for the interpersonal attitudes, the affiliation and status. We are particularly interested in the affiliation, which uh, ranges from being hostile to friendly, and it is actually the degree of wanting a closing relationship with someone else. So we combine personality and interpersonal attitude, and this picture shows all the theories that we have been drawing from human social psychology, and we see here our relational, uh, 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 graphic representation of a uh, relational agent that is exhibiting this nonverbal immediacy cues of smile, gaze, and proxies. The user, by observing these cues, is forming impressions of uh, uh, the agent interpersonal attitude and personality together with his own personality is making this decisions based on the predicted outcome value theory about uh, spending more time with that agent. And the, all of this, um, it does not happen in the void. It happens in space and time. That's why we came up with another model from uh, human social psychology, the Kendall Greedy model, where the, uh, that sets the, the ground for, uh, for the social interactions that we are focusing on, first meeting encounters. In this model, you can, uh, you can see, um, uh, you can imagine there is a person A approaching a person B to greet this person, and Kendall observed uh, in the social interactions, uh, that there was a patterns of behaviors that were occurring in a specific space uh, while person A was approaching B. And these behaviors were actually accomplishing some functions that person B wants to deliver towards the approaching person. And those functions that they are uh, happening in the space uh, while A is getting closer to B are what we call communicative functions or this greeting encounter. The behavior that they, uh, accomplishes the, the, these functions are uh, also part of the uh, nonverbal immediacy cues that, that we were focusing on. Our, in our thesis, we are tweaking some of these behaviors in this uh, user studies that you will see in a minute to see if persons would make, uh, would form different impressions of the agents in that specific, con specific context of first meeting and context. So we move now to uh, this theoretical frame of description, which is the, me, uh, the, the big uh, uh, micro contribution of this thesis divided up in three studies. And then we move to the practical work, which is another micro contribution of this uh, thesis work. For this uh, theoretical framework, we actually had uh, <coughs> complex questions that we couldn't answer with a single user study. We divided that it up in uh, three different studies where we focused on specific questions. And uh, in our first study, the behavior interpretation study, we were just uh, focusing on um, agents exhibiting this nonverbal immediacy cues and how users interpreted those cues in terms of personality and interpersonal attitude. By knowing that, we moved to the second study where we wanted to know what is the impact of these impressions on the users in terms of the relational decisions that they can take about the agent. And finally, the first two studies were done in a lab setting. We moved to the real setting, uh, and managing the impressions on a real setting application, giving also users more freedom, and you will see later uh, the meaning of this. So for the behavior interpretation study, we uh, set up the context in a virtual reception of a museum. People were observing this uh, agent in a 3D environment. We had two different trials uh, where we were also um, studying uh, the um, interpretation of nonverbal behaviors uh, using two different perspectives. The, they were both, um, these agents were both observed by subjects on a regular LCD screen, but in the first case, in first person perspective. In the second case, the user <coughs> character was visible. This is what is called avatar <coughs> in the environment. And we wanted to see whether there was a difference in the interpretation of behaviors. So what we manipulated were uh, the agent's nonverbal uh, behaviors according to two levels of smile, gaze, and proximis, and mapped onto the uh, Kendon's breathing model. So these behaviors were exhibited at different points. The custom point, uh, it's not uh, uh, provided by the Kendon model, but it was added to uh, manipulate the uh, gaze behavior of the agent. So at that point, the agent would gaze at the user, and you will see um, uh, now in this video how uh, the manipulation were done. 
So this is the condition, for example, where there was no smile at all. People were observing, standing still in front of the screen, these approaches. And you can see that the agent is like, um, uh, the, it has this robotic form to avoid other unwanted impressions. In this case, at the point one where the distance annotation should happen, there was a smile animation started uh, from the agent. And for example, this is the high percentage of cases at the user where at, uh, at specific point like point one, point two, and uh, point three, there are cases at the, uh, towards the user. And finally, the step, uh, proximate step condition was a little step towards the user at the end of the approach, at point number three. So based on these observations, after uh, observing each of these approaches towards the agents, um, subjects were uh, um, uh, replying to these questions. We are, were assessing what were their impressions of the agent extraversion, the main two, and the, the agent friendliness, so personality and attitude. And also, we wanted to uh, explore some other uh, variables, and we asked if they had different uh, impressions beyond what we were focusing on. And we asked them to write down the first three adjectives that came in their mind after meeting each of these guys. And uh, as an exploratory variable, we also asked them, so you have seen that the uh, approach was ending uh, when the um, user character was close to the agent. And uh, we asked them, would you like to spend more time with that agent if you had the opportunity later? Uh, after meeting all of these guys, uh, these agents, we also assessed the subject's own personality to see if there was a relationship between what they were interpreting and uh, they, their self, their personality. The hypothesis for this uh, study, so we had two hypotheses on our two main uh, measurements. The, uh, so that the judgments of the agent's extraversion would depend on the observant smile, gaze, and proximity cues that we manipulated, but also on the user's own uh, personality. <coughs> and the same for the, other, uh, for the other measurement. So this slide here shows at the bottom a recap of our hypothesis. And then for the two trials, we had 32 subjects. And in the first trial, you can see that we, uh, we had a main effect of the agent proximity behavior, which means that uh, agents stepping toward the users were uh, judged as more extrovert. Whereas we had for smiling gates a main effect on agent friendliness, which means that uh, agents smiling and gazing more at the users were judged as more friendly. So same results. Actually, we got the, the same results for the, um, uh, for the other perspective, and uh, the, the orange boxes are uh, telling us that there were only a partial significant interaction effect between the uh, gaze manipulations and the subject's own personality trait. In this case, agreeableness, for example, uh, on, the, on the left side. But what is important to see uh, from these results is that, uh, so in both trials, results help. That means uh, that uh, our interpretation is that um, uh, the, the, the using a different camera perspective does not affect the user's interpretation of the agent's behavior. Uh, it is also important to look at it vertically because there was a sharp distinction between these uh, cues, but in uh, human social psychology, they all of them they can account for different impressions of personality or attitude. In this case, people were uh, actually um, associating proximity only with extraversion and uh, smiling gates only with fairness, with this sharp distinction. By knowing this, we move to the second study, where here we were using our knowledge. But we uh, changed a bit the uh, user-agent um, user interaction design, so we had here life-size character, people still um, are standing still in front of the screen. And um, the, our main question here was, so what is the impact when we are forming this, when users are forming these impressions of the agent in terms of relational decisions, which we mean likely the frequencies of subsequent encounters with these agents, which means uh, spending more time with them later. The design for this experiment was this uh, big screen with, uh, with uh, life-size agents and then uh, a tablet on the left side of the subjects uh, because we would tell them that they would meet this, uh, we presented these uh, agents as guides of a virtual museum. We said that we had a virtual museum reconstruction in 3D that they would visit later and each of these guides that the subjects uh, uh, met 
was offering them the possibility of uh, guided uh, visits. So the subjects were uh, replying to this uh, preference for each guy, and um, we map the behavior uh, uh, into two different manipulation of the guides, extraversion and friendliness in two levels, according to our previous results. This was still within subject design, and uh, subjects were deceived to believe that the guided tools that they will pick with this guide will be uh, actually done later, so they had to come back to the our lab facilities. I will get to back uh, get back to this in a minute. So, the main two measures were uh, related to the relation of decisions. It was the likelihood of encounters after meeting each of these guides, uh, and the number of visits that they would like to do with that specific one. After meeting all of them, we uh, asked them to, sh to choose a preferred guide between the four that they met or even uh, uh, none of them. And finally, we asked them to, uh, we also assess their own personality, again, to see if there was a relationship within their choices and their own personality. And this is the concept, uh, it's, it, it's just a snippet of the concept declaration that we gave them beforehand to give, uh, to, to, to actually receive from them a real commitment to come back according to the visits that they would choose uh, at our lab facilities and then uh, spend time with these agents in the guided tours with them. <coughs> in this case, we actually uh, had two hypotheses for the two main measurements of visits and the likelihood of encounters. And here we are comparing personality and attitude. And according to uh, what uh, we say at the beginning of this presentation, we uh, uh, predicted that extraversion as a long-term trait will interact with the user's own personality in the choices, the choices of the likelihood of encounters and the number of visits, and uh, friendliness as a short-term characteristics and more uh, dynamic will be having a main effect at that time on the user's decisions. And finally, we, uh, the, we also predicted the main effect of the uh, agent friendliness on the preferred guy that would be chosen. What we got, actually, these are the results. In this case, we, we had 24 subjects, and uh, all of them but one were able to uh, choose a, a preferred guide. We didn't observe any uh, significant effect for the subject's uh, own personality. Uh, um, in terms of subject own personality and choices, but what is interesting, this chart here is actually showing the, um, on the x-axis the, the four different uh, uh, guides that uh, subjects met and the number of visits that, the, that they would choose for each of the guides. And on the y-axis you can see the frequencies of these uh, choices. And for the high friendliness uh, guide, we had a main effect, and in fact, regardless of the extraversion level, people would prefer to spend more time and uh, more likely with friendly guides. So in light of these two results, we uh, wanted to do something in a real application setting, and also you have seen in the first and second study, people were observing this interaction by standing still. So we wanted to give them freedom, as also Candon's model um, describes of uh, moving towards the agent as, a, uh, as also a representation of uh, reality. And so what we have done, we worked at the Boston Museum of Science in collaboration with Northeastern University with Tinker. Uh, Tinker is an exhibit there uh, in the computer place area. Uh, it is a relational agent that uh, gives uh, visitors directions around the museum and also explains some basic concepts of, of computer science. And uh, users interact with this agent by placing their uh, left hand in a reader that uh, detects their presence. And also, uh, they observe on a big, tall LCD screen the agent. Um, and they input utterances in a touch menu screen at the, their right. So what we have done, we um, added to this agent an additional sensor, a Microsoft Connect, to detect visitors approaching and apply our model for the previous two studies. In this case, our main question was, okay, from the previous two, we know that uh, some behaviors can lead to impressions of friendliness, and friendliness is uh, the trait that is preferred by people when assessing whether to spend time with that agent. In this case at the museum, we were wondering 
um, by managing thinkers' impressions of friendliness, would people be more engaged in, uh, more uh, willing to do an interaction with this agent, and also would they spend more time with this uh, installation, uh, having a, 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 a conversation with this agent at the museum? Uh, well, in this case, given the, uh, the, the high amount of uh, subjects, possible subjects, we went for a between subject design with three different uh, separate groups uh, assigned to the three different conditions. One was the control condition where the agent was not reacting at all while visitors were approaching and was just waking up from a sleeping animation at the end of the visitor's approach. Uh, in the other two groups, Tinker was managing impressions of hostility or friendliness according to uh, the behaviors that uh, and the, the results of our previous study, so showing an interface and not so much uh, a lower a low percentage of gaze at the visitors in hostile condition, and also a male and uh, um, a, a high amount of gaze in the friendly condition. According to our goals, we had two main measures. So the visitor actions, which can be seen as a commitment of the visitors to engage in an interaction, divided up in uh, sub-steps. So visitors quitting the approach at any point perform zero steps. Visitors uh, arriving uh, at point one, so finishing the approach and arriving at this point, were performing one action. Uh, visitors placing their hand in the leader would perform two actions. And finally, after listening some instruction from the agent, Visitors uh, being ready to start a conversation would perform the third and last action. As for the other uh, measurement, we were just uh, measuring the duration of these uh, conversational sessions. In this case, we had two hypotheses for the two measurements. So uh, we predicted that the friendly thinker uh, group will perform a higher number <coughs> of actions uh, compared to the low uh, friendly group or the hostile thinker group, and this in turn compared to the control group, where the agent was not showing any reaction at all. Same hypothesis, but for the other measurement, the session duration. The participants, so I'm showing you an analysis that uh, ran uh, the, of the study from December last year to October 2013. Um, we had 30,000 people approaching the exhibit, but out of this number, and according to our uh, theoretical model, we had to, we had to, to, to do some uh, cleanup operations because, uh, for example, the model predicts um, uh, supports reading interactions for, uh, for in one-to-one -one, uh, scenarios. And in our case, there were a lot of visitors coming in group and approaching the exhibit. So we had to clean up this data. We had also to clean up data of visitors uh, 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 moving backwards or changing suddenly their direction and not approaching the exhibit because they were not experiencing properly our manipulations. Uh, out, of the, uh, out of this number, we divided it up in the three different groups for the three different conditions. I'm showing you here some uh, trends and I warn you that these are not statistically significant but for the session duration in this chart here for the three different groups you can see that the duration was uh, actually, on average, longer for the hostile version of Tinker. So people were having longer uh, session duration. Uh, and this chart here, still uh, showing a trend and not statistically significant, it's showing uh, the three different uh, three uh, actions that uh, the visitors could perform for the three different groups. And uh, on the y-axis, you can see the retention rate. That means the number of people that were holding on and continuing uh, uh, engaging uh, towards the interaction with the agent. So, for example, we see in the control group uh, that 10% were completing the approach, and then only 8.6% were putting their hand in the reader, and finally 7.2% were starting uh, ready to start a conversation. And the highest retention rates are for the friendly thinker version, as we were predicting with our hypothesis, but this is only a trend. So in light of this, we wanted to understand more what was going on at the museum. And we ran a web survey where people were comparing the two different uh, versions of thinker where he is being hostile or friendly towards the visitor in the approach. 
and they were rating the uh, agent uh, friendliness, and also they were writing down three adjectives, the first three that came in their mind, as in our first study. Interesting that it is interesting that people were not able to see differences between the two, and you can see from the adjectives here they were judged as nice, polite, likable, and uh, uh, friendly. But for the hostile intervention, we had also people judging this agent as lifeless and cold. And instead, for the friendly intervention, where there was actually a smile, a prominent smile, during the approach, people were judging this agent as creepy and untrustworthy. And this is very important for relational agents, because this is a key important feature that the agent should be able to carry on. To being able to uh, build a relationship with the user. So the lesson learned is that the study done in advance would have helped a lot at the installation of the museum, but also that giving a smile from a lab setting to the real world changes a lot, and it is also not possible to detach that smile from the real body, or from, from the body that is actually uh, exhibiting it. So that's uh, uh, our explanation for this. So we move now to the uh, second part of the um, presentation where we apply the uh, findings of our uh, theoretical framework to a computational solution to generate in real time nonverbal uh, behavior in uh, agents during the first encounters with their users. And some of the details in this part will primarily make sense for people in the ECA community. But so what we have been working uh, for this computational solution is also um, a, it was also a design goal to make it flexible and also um, accessible from other research groups. And that means that we made a uh, solution Cyba Complia. Cyba is a, a common framework that automates the generation of multimodal behavior in embodied conversational agents. And the main idea behind this framework is that there is a complete separation between the functions that the agents are delivering and the behavior that they are used to accomplish those functions. And these two different um, uh, functions and behaviors are, uh, can be represented by these two languages, uh, XML-like, XML and BML. I'll give you an example of uh, uh, how an application uh, uh, should fit in this cyber framework. So we have our uh, running software, our agent, which wants to uh, perform a distance salutation, which is a function that can be represented using FML. That function is actually um, transformed in behaviors that can be executed, for example, gaze and smile. This behavior can be executed either on a virtual character uh, or on a robotic character. So, for our solution, the BML standard was ready and already uh, established by the community, the ECA community, but we had to work on the BML <coughs> standard because there were some ideas, but not, uh, it was not, uh, uh, there isn't actually a standard uh, available. So, in order to uh, come up with a standard definition of this language, we uh, made an analysis of the issues that they need to be addressed, and that the language has to be um, uh, capable of representing. So, uh, the, an important issue was to define and separate the context from the, from the interaction, uh, and so being um, uh, an FML being uh, capable of representing this contextual information. For example, I can, um, um, I can, I, I, uh, an agent might want to accomplish a distance salutation function, but in different cultural uh, settings. So the behaviors that can be used to accomplish the function can be different, and uh, this cultural background can be part of the contextual information of the um, of the interaction. Uh, another important issue that we want to address with this language is, the, is actually the definition and classification of the functions that can be expressed by the FML. Also, uh, there is an important issue on how we transform from FML to BML. Since it's XML-based, so uh, it, it comes natural to use XLT transformation rules, but we were wondering whether built-in or different methods were possible. 
and uh, it is also important that we, uh, from uh, also from gathering information from previous workshops uh, in the FML and the cyber community, we were uh, looking at this important point of being able to represent some functions that they are unconsciously generated. For example, from emotional states of someone. And uh, last two points. Uh, there was a, uh, we underlined the necessity of defined temporal constraints, course temporal constraints to organize the different uh, FML representation, maybe between, um, among different participants in an interaction. And also we had to come up with a definition of what is exactly this representation and how, uh, who is targeted to, to a single agent at time or to multiple agents at time. So this is an overview of our uh, FML that we proposed. Um, this is just a recap of all the issues that we want to address. So we have this representation in two different parts. In, in a declaration part, we are uh, uh, um, able to express some um, contextual information. And in our case, we uh, might want to include, for example, personality or interpersonal attitude. These are just some data that it can affect also um, the generation later of BML. And then in the body part, I'm not going to go into details of this, but it, we divided it up in two different tracks. And this is actually our categorization of functions. And these tracks, they can contain small elements called FML chunks. And these two parts are actually merged together when transforming this FML into BML. The last track of the body part can be is a, is a special track that is uh, made to uh, um, to host this unconscious function. So the definition of this function goes there. And let's go into the details of the FML chunk. So this is the smallest unit of FML that is ready to be transformed into BML. And here we had to come up with some uh, timing um, issues and. The, the contents of this chunk are functions, but the timing information, it's very important for the coordination among different FML chunks. And uh, uh, according to the timing primitives that we came up with, we had to solve uh, uh, ske um, uh, some scheduling problems. Uh, so first of all, the representation of this, ch of this timing information, and then we have to solve the, some scheduling problems of FML according to the primitives that someone might use. Um, and unfortunately, there is uh, not enough time to go into details in that. And just as an example here, you, uh, you can see uh, some example of functions that can be included in the interaction of track that they are very close to our application domain. So the initiation of the interaction or the closing with the different types according to the theoretical stance that we have taken using Kenwood's model. Uh, this here, this slide, shows you the design or computational solution that um, took advantage of the FML definition. And we actually made it so that uh, every agent in a system will run a module called FML Greeting Agent, which is perception and realization capabilities. And uh, these modules, they all communicate with a central service, which, uh, which is a shared central solution that is able to transform the functions and uh, schedule them according to the timing primitives and uh, uh, give back to the agents the behavior to be realized. Uh, our goals were scalability and flexibility. In fact, this, uh, small sum models, they all run in a different agents, but the central service gets all the inputs from all of them. And as a flexibility, so the different FML greeting agents are uh, designed for our application domain in first meeting encounters, but the FML central service, it's a general purpose uh, FML um, the transformer. So that uh, they can take any FML representation and transform it in, uh, uh, that potentially could transform it in, in BML. And this is uh, actually the architecture in detail of the two models. So we have the FML leading agent and then the FML service, some uh, static data uh, storing, for example, information about the agent personality and attitude that we want to manage. Um, and unit management that is actually uh, working as a subscribe or unsub um, un uh, unsubscribed uh, service to the central FML service module. This FML service is aware of all the active agents in the system at a certain point with this uh, registered agents list. 
and uh, there is a, a perception part in the FML Greening Agent, which, uh, which is actually perceiving the world, in our case, it's perceiving the distances between the agent and other agents or the user, and uh, it's understanding this in terms of the um, breeding phase of the, of the, of the encounter, uh, as in our uh, theoretical model, and uh, planning a reaction. So the agent is planning a reaction according to, the, to, this, um, to the distance, the interpersonal distance between the agent and the user. This reaction is represented in FML, which is sent to the uh, service model. And here, three steps uh, happen. So the FML is first scheduled according to the timing privileges. Then, according to the rules, uh, external rules that can be provided by a designer, they are transformed, this FML is transformed to BML. And then the, the BML finally is dispatched to the agents to be realized by a specific submodel uh, BML realizer. And this can be also for different agents. So uh, finally, there is a, a small submodule for the error management uh, in case there are some errors in this uh, three steps transformation. I'm going to go now in a technical demonstration of the, this computational solution in action. So um, this demonstration here has been done uh, within the um, Icelandic language and culture training in virtual reality project. And so you will see here two different agents running uh, in real time this uh, uh, two models. The central model is transforming and uh, creating for them the BML uh, the behaviors to be realized. The first agent here, it is actually um, uh, managing impressions and he's uh, uh, extrovert and friendly. So according to the model, he's looking at the user, smiling and uh, stepping at the end. These are some debug informations. This is showing that there is a territorial negotiation between the user and the agent. And the, uh, the name at the right, it's actually uh, the function that, is, uh, that the agent is actually delivering. And the behavior is, of course, is visible. So uh, as we are approaching, it's looking at us and is stepping towards the user. And then at the end of the approach, we can see that there is at the end of the smiling face animation. We move towards another character. Uh, to see the extreme opposite where we have an hostile and uh, introverted guy. So some behaviors are the same for the initial phase of the encounter, but uh, he, uh, he has a, a low percentage of gaze at the user during the approach, and he is not smiling at all. So this is a simple application of our uh, uh, theoretical model at work in, uh, in virtual reality here. Okay. So we, we move now to the very last part of this presentation. What we have seen in this thesis is actually a theoretical framework combining different theories in human social psychology and in, uh, using these theories in uh, three evaluation studies that we have been uh, looking at. We have seen also a representation for communicative functions by the definition of a language FML uh, the, for, uh, with this FMS specification, and we have seen also an analysis of the issues that needed to be addressed in order to get to this specification. We have seen also some practical work uh, that applied the FMS specification and the findings of our theoretical framework into uh, a computational solution for the autonomous generation of verbal behaviors in first meeting encounters, and a practical demo in the uh, virtual reality project. As a main contributions of the thesis, so from the relational agent's perspective, so we observe uh, that nonverbal behavior in first impressions, uh, agents' nonverbal behaviors, uh, users by observing this behavior can, can quickly form impressions of extraversion and friendliness. And in particular, impressions of friendliness may lead to uh, relational decisions of spending more time with the agent later. From the human-computer interaction perspective, so the, we have seen that uh, theories in human-human uh, interaction are actually migrating into human-agent interaction. 
and also our approach migrates from regular LCD screens to life science carter and with a particular note uh, we have to see some uh, address some contextual information also into real settings from the computational linguistics point of view we presented a, a representation of communicative functions with the FMR standard we also solved the problem of scheduling and according to the timing primitive the FML chunks. And finally, from the system engineering point of view, we have seen a um, computational solution for the real time generation of behaviors and the design and architecture of this solution. Of course, there are some limitations and uh, insights for future work that we might want to address later. So, uh, first theoretical limitation, it's uh, coming from our model that we have chosen. So Kendon was observing one-to-one -one reading encounters. We had this limitation, uh, actually uh, we have seen this at the museum, where we could not use data of group of people approaching the agent. So we might want to move to different configuration of interaction where there is a group of people approaching another group, or as a, a group approaching a single agent. And uh, we have not also, we have uh, focused on the ending of the greeting encounter where the farewell or the breakaway um, happens. So uh, this might be also an important consideration to take, how uh, an agent could uh, hold the impressions that he ma is managing at the very first beginning of the encounter, also in the behavior that they are exhibited later for these uh, secondary phases. Uh, um, conclusive phases. Um, for the FMR standard, uh, it is true that the standard is ready, but um, we need community feedback, and we hope to uh, uh, discuss this in an upcoming workshop uh, in next August uh, with the next uh, Intelligent Virtual Agents Conference. Uh, as for the studies, it is actually uh, important to note that we, we had subjects doing the self reports. Uh, for example, when expressing the preference for a uh, number of visits and then coming back to the lab. But it would be interesting to see whether a behavioral measure in a longitudinal uh, design would be more effective in understanding this aspect. And also we want to see whether the um, uh, impressions that people are forming of these agents in the very first moment, um, how, uh, what is the stability of these impressions later, how long they last. Uh, finally, so we might want to explore more the subject of personality aspect in this context and also we could um, expand um, the different set of cues, nonverbal behaviors that we are exhibiting uh, by, uh, uh, with the agents. It is also interesting to uh, explore different personality traits, impressions of these different traits or different uh, uh, dimensions of the interpersonal attitudes. And finally, completely different dimensions, like the web survey was suggesting the trustworthiness of our own agent. So this is the conclusion of the presentation. And uh, I would like to say you a uh, final, uh, final thing, which is um, in Icelandic. So, tak at lir saman fir komna. Siers tak a tak kiter anesar o askola ideja dikul. Fir fesa flower. So now uh, we can take questions from the general audience. Uh, so we will have uh, 10 minutes to do that, 10, 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll start a closed session with the committee. So if there are any general questions. So suppose we had two agents that I'm going to come up to as a person and interact with. Does the FML service have some way to coordinate their behavior so they don't say hi both at the same time? Uh, yes, thanks to the timing uh, primitives that they coordinate the different FML chunks, it is possible to um, coordinate uh, these different executions. But the ordering of that, it's on a, a more coarse grain scale because of the functions that they are delivering. And then there is a more of a work that, is, that has to be done with the BML coordination, the behavior coordination of that. But that it is possible.
I was thinking about the study in the museum uh, yes. because you didn't get any uh, correlation. But do you think you would get uh, another uh, some correlation if you would uh, interview them or observe them or use another uh, way of gathering the data there? Uh, how the users react? Yeah, uh, so the main uh, issue there is that uh, we had to collect this data anonymously. So we had, uh, thankfully we had the consent from the museum uh, to uh, detect visitors. So this was categorized as an observational study. So we were able to detect visitors approaching, but we would not be uh, able to uh, gain more information. Uh, for example, uh, the demographics of the specific people that they were interacting, um, and for doing these uh, um, uh, observations, uh, we would have done a completely different design, where you have to be there and ask permission to record, and there are some privacy issues also. questions that you find to ask as well is uh, with the museum study and you find out that okay your hypothesis is not supported mm. and uh, then perhaps the reason might be that it doesn't matter as well right uh, so I think it's it's always hard to so, so the natural tendency, if you set up an experiment and your hypothesis fails, you think, oh, I must have done something wrong because uh, this must be the case, right? That's so then we consider that at least for uh, this particular case where people might be, for instance, interested in exhibits anyway, it doesn't make yeah, there are the two opposites, that they will go in either case or they are not interested at all and then they move towards another place. Uh, in fact, one of the limitations also of the study is that um, we uh, are not completely sure that people were experiencing uh, all of the interaction since we would need uh, some um, uh, user face detection to see, for example, if there is uh, eye contact all the time. and. The trends were showing that uh, actually the two different, the two different conditions, at least that, that they were uh, having an impact compared to the control, where there's no reaction at all. So at least doing something, it's uh, more than the no reaction at all. But we could not confirm that uh, with uh, the state, and we are still gathering data now. So you were interested in uh, your first two studies, looking at um, agreeableness and personality, right? So how did you decide how to combine the influences of those in the behavior data? Uh, um, so you mean the user own personality? Well, the agents, the agents' personality. Yeah, okay. So we were focusing on the extroversion and then on the um, interpersonal attitude. And we decided to combine these two uh, based on the observation that uh, it is uh, more likely to have different attitudes, it is more dynamic, but personality, it is, it is not impossible, but unlikely that will change during an interaction. So we, will, we were interested to see how these two are interacting together in this context of making decisions. Yes, but, but for each of those theories independently, you had a behavior that you were using to display that effect, that manipulation. Yeah. And they're potentially orthogonal, but how do you, how do you decide how to find their effects? So the reason, uh, so it goes down to the behavior that we decided, and uh, primarily there was also a um, uh, technical issue that in the environments, those three behaviors 
are clearly visible from the distance, that was the context that we were setting up. So proximus cues are visible, a smiling animation and gaze behavior. Uh, we could do more, for example, with uh, more detailed facial animations, uh, but those three were uh, suitable for the, the type of interaction that we were doing. So starting from this point. could also be a cue for extroversion, right? Exactly. And that's why we were, um, it is interesting to see the results of the first study where people were completely making a difference between the proximity skewed and then the smiling gates. There was no overlap between the two judgments. Okay. But th th there's, okay. Yeah, so there's a question. I was wondering about the, uh, uh, the second part, which will include the FML, which is more, um, if you describe it in your thesis, it's also one of the requirements is that it should be easier for people to write down uh, and then sort of think about XML because people can read it to a certain extent and stuff like that. But I was thinking, so what did you learn? What, what, what were your major lessons from doing this kind of exercise? It is very complex to uh, try to organize what are the communicative functions. So it is a hard task first to define, to actually decide what has to be addressed. That's very complex. And then uh, finding out one sort of a space between all of this uh, chaos, it's, uh, it's easier than so to come up with a specific solution. But the hard part of it is to come up with agreement on what is exactly a function, what, is that, what it has to be represented, and what are the different issues. That's a, I think that's a very big deal of the work. What are the benefits? Uh, the benefits is that we might have a concrete FML, so that people will be able to start using it and see finally the whole pipeline of cyber at work. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, I was actually one of the subjects in one of the studies, which I found very interesting. But you know, you have 32 people in each study. Yeah. Uh, so my question was, you know, it's a fair number, but not a huge number. Is that something you were, uh, were you aiming for a higher number, or were you satisfied with the number? And so, given the two trials, we were satisfied with that, because it was also the design uh, was a within subject design, and that's a good number for that. We were not so uh, happy with the second study with 20, um, 24 subjects. Uh, that was, uh, I think, the problem uh, why we didn't find any interaction effect. But for the first one, it's a, a fair amount of subjects. We, what we have in statistics, it's a um, statistical power with those, those numbers. Yes. Okay. There are not more questions. Uh, let me thank everyone for coming to this defense. And, uh, Remind you that at 4.30 on the third floor here at the Mars building will be a reception. Thank you very much.